All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Vibrant Integrative Educational Webinar Series. This month, we are bringing back Vibrant Superstar Clinical Support Team to talk about the connections between connective tissue disorders and meat, rheumatoid arthritis and meat, and present some really profound case studies demonstrating the power of the wheat zoomer for initial root cause assessment, as well as ongoing monitoring of gluten-free diets and symptoms. On today's webinar, we have presenting Kat Simmons, the lead clinical dietitian at Vibrant, who is located in Colorado. Under Kat's guidance, the clinical support team has really made an impact on the way that Vibrant's providers and patients are educated about their labs and the clinical interventions available to them. We also have co-presenting Suzanne Barker, a clinical dietitian practicing integrative and functional nutrition located in Dallas, Texas area, and Tammy Russell, a functional dietitian located in the Portland area. Um, Tammy joined the team earlier this year and has really brought an immense wealth of experience in functional and integrative nutrition, as well as, um, you know, the, the experience of the rest of the team members. We have, um, as well, um, team members who have contributed to the presentation, Suzette Garcia, who is a nutritionist in the Miami area, and Mary Beth Augustine, a clinical dietitian located in New York, both, both of them um, obviously coming from a functional nutrition background. So I'm really excited to walk through this information as well as the data we have from some internal studies conducted by Vibrant's research and development department. And then we're going to present some great case studies and resources that are going to make the wheat zoomer a central part of a really solid functional medicine practice. Um, so then at the end of the webinar, we will have some time for Q&A. Um, if you have questions, go ahead and type them into the question box or the chat feature, whichever shows up on your screen. And we'll get to those at the end. Um, some of them may be questions that we can go ahead and answer and clear out of the way during the webinar, though. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Kat, who is going to start us off on the subject of con connective tissue disorders and meat. Cool. Thanks very much, Sarah. I'm going to request control of your screen here. All right, you should be good. Awesome. Okay. Well, thanks for joining us today and, um, and for all of our webinar series. Um, we wanted to take this opportunity, like Sarah said, to present some of the internal analytics that we have kind of collected on the back end through our laboratory. Um, we've come up with some really exciting correlations, um, kind of creating you know some crosstalk between some of our lab testing specifically today we're going to be focused on our connective tissue panel and our wheat zoomer which i'm sure all of us know and love um, so the data is pretty enlightening um, and we're gonna i'm gonna just talk you through what we found over the past two years looking at these numbers All right, so um, you, you may not know, Vibrant has a very exhaustive con connective tissue panel um, on the Vibrant America side of our lab requisition. Um, it's highly specific and sensitive tests to identify predictive antibodies for several um, autoimmune connective tissue disorders. Um, which are on the rise in our country, as with most autoimmune disease, um, and can really help, you know, the, the efficacy of advanced testing is oftentimes shortening that patient journey from symptom onset to figuring out, you know, a true cause. Um, and when we talk about connective tissue disease, we are talking about disorders that affect tissues such as collagen and elastin and the soft tissue in between joints. These disorders are highly inflammatory in nature, and they're often um, comorbid with other autoimmune diseases. As we all know, autoimmune diseases often run in families. Um, and you know, a lot of our conversation is going to be focused on celiac and wheat here in the next few slides, but we do see the grouping of autoimmune disorders frequently. 
So just to speak a little bit to the current prevalence of connective tissue disease, um, I think the stats in our country cite about a 3% population prevalence, um, which is an end rising. Um, celiac disease makes up about 1% of the current population. So connective to, to CTD does affect currently more of our society than celiac and other autoimmune diseases. Um, as with most autoimmune disorders, unfortunately, women tend to be affected more than men. And with connective tissue disease, the ratio is a pretty outstanding, um, about 10 to 1 diagnosis ratio of women compared to men specific for connective tissue disorders. And we use connective tissue disease or connective tissue disorder to kind of lump together, together several different disease states. Um, here we've highlighted just a few. This is not an all-inclusive list, but we are talking about um, disease manifestations such as systemic lupus, Sjogren's, rheumatoid arthritis, polyomyositis, um, dermatological, crest, and then we can have mixed connective tissue disorders as well. Um, so they, they definitely tend to group together. Um, there are specific biomarkers for specific disease states, and we'll talk about that in relation to our ENA11 panel. Um, but typically, these diseases are fairly hard to identify and diagnose due to lack of you know, high quality diagnosis, diagnostic criteria, and lab testing available. Oh my goodness. Okay. So, you know, I alluded to this a second ago, but you know, there are a lot of people walking around um, not feeling well and not being able to find a root cause for their symptoms. Um, and connective tissue disorders certainly follow in, into this category. Um, the current stat is that the average patient goes for almost four years from symptom onset before meeting diagnostic criteria. We know in the realm of celiac disease uh, that diagnostic period tends to be longer, sometimes up to a decade. So there is definitely disconnect and then a delay in this diagnos diagnosing cascade from when people start to feel crummy to when a provider can accur accurately pinpoint what's going on. Um, you combine that with the fact that a lot of these symptoms are really nonspecific. Um, you see on the right-hand side here, hair loss, muscle pain, numbness, tingling, inflammation, low-grade fever, fatigue, um, joint pain, skin and rash, you know, sensitive skin, rashes, um, sensitivity to heat is another one. I mean, when we look at them all together, that gives us a better picture that they're, you know, that in my mind, at least we start connecting the dots a little bit, but independently, none of those symptoms are defined. So it can be very hard, um, especially if a provider, if a patient's not going to a functionally minded practitioner to get someone to listen to them, take them seriously, and run the right testing. And hence, we have such a delay in the period of time that can pass between figuring out what's going on. So there's clearly a need for advanced diagnostic testing in this realm. Um, we wanna decrease the time from symptom onset to diagnosis, or at least identifying biomarkers that can um, then work with patient symptoms to adequately diagnose. Um, a lot of times the symptoms progress faster than diagnostic testing can pick up on, and we're gonna talk about that with our the data that we've shown with our ANA relative to our ENA panel. Some pretty exciting information there. Um, and then the fact that, you know, a lot of times the current treatments for these ailments are really just acting as a band-aid. So they're not the root cause of the disease as we know, and they're not fundamentally addressing what's going on. And in the meantime, people don't feel better. And that's ultimately the goal for what we're trying to achieve. So 
So here at Vibrant, um, and we're going to talk about our connective tissue panel collectively. We do have a very robust panel, again, offered under our Vibrant America requisition. Um, and that panel comprises our rheumatoid arthritis panel, making up uh, rheumatoid factor antibodies, anti-CCP3 antibodies, um, along with CRP. These three biomarkers can be combined into a DAS score algorithm um, for a 99% specific and sensitive um, diagnostic criteria for rheumatoid arthritis. We also offer a ANA. Um, you may be familiar with ANA. ANA has been around for a very long time. Um, we have brought our ANA test onto our microchip platform, which offers um, automatic detection of the pattern levels and often a higher degree of titers. Um, and then Traditionally, ENA is run as a reflex to an ANA, and we're going to show you some data here why we really feel that the simultaneous detection of ANA and ENA is very utilitarian in, the, in this disease um, diagnostic world. Um, but we do offer a very comprehensive ENA panel looking at 11 different um, antibodies specific to different to uh, definitive connective tissue disorders. Most standard reference labs are offering either an ENA4 or an ENA6. So to get an ENA11 all in one place um, is pretty powerful. So this is the first internal data that I want to present to you, and we're going to expound on this when we talk about some of the wheat zoomer findings. Um, but about coming up on a year ago now, uh, the lab took uh, some internal research, a, a subset of 110 subjects. Um, we pulled this data showing that on first presentation, uh, this group of subjects had a negative ANA panel, but a positive ENA on an initial draw. And remember what I said earlier that traditionally um, in, this, in this world of testing, ANA is done on its own. Um, a provider will run an ANA. If that ANA comes back positive, an ENA will then be expanded upon as sort of a reflex. Um, here at Vibrant, because our microchip technology allows for the simultaneous um, well, basically, we can run both tests simultaneously on our chip. Um, we, have all, we have always done this ENA in conjunction with the ANA in conjunction with the ENA at the same time. That's why we're able to produce these data, this data set here today. Um, so a subset of um, a subset of 110 subjects showed a, let's see, a negative ANA but a positive ENA on an initial draw. They then followed these subjects for two years and found that 20% of these patients that initially had the uh, negative ANA went on to develop a positive ANA within the next two years. So we're sort of looking at ANA as, I'm not going to call it antiquated because it's certainly not antiquated and there is certainly ut utility in looking at an ANA, but I think we need to dive deeper. There are certain limitations to ANA testing um, and looking at an ENA panel simultaneously can often be more predictive and identifying these antibodies at a two-year earlier window than um, running an ANA alone, and that's definitely some pretty powerful data. This is just giving you, this is from our marketing piece um, for our connective tissue panel, but kind of gives you a layout of everything that our connective tissue panel offers. Again, um, an ANA looking at pattern types, which are all, that's another, um, you know, traditional limitation with ANA testing is that these pattern um, these patterns are often interpreted by a human being looking at them. Um, with our microchip technology, we've done uh, automated pattern interpretation, which removes that variability of human error. Um, an ENA eleven panel, our, our RF panel, um, combined at one time. So 
So again, to speak to this vibrant advantage, um, I mean, any of you are, who are familiar with us as a lab um, are likely familiar with our multiplex, uh, multi-chip technology, um, which does offer superior testing for antibody antigen recognition. Again, we're running simultaneous ANA, ENA detection, automated ANA pattern detection, comprehensive ENA 11, panel that those antigens are highly specific for certain deep disease states, um, combining that with our rheumatoid arthritis antibodies um, that can be used with a DAS score to look at a patient's risk for RA. Okay, so now I want to move on and I want to talk about kind of hot off the press um, internal data that uh, we have published um, in the past couple months. And this is relevant to associations with connective tissue disease and celiac and wheat sensitivity um, based on coincident lab testings for patients who have drawn our connective tissue panel um, in addition to our wheat zoomer, uh, which hopefully everyone on this call is, is very familiar with our wheat zoomer test. It's certainly near and dear to my heart, uh, kind of one of the hallmark tests on the Vibrant platform. And we have now been working with the wheat zoomer for almost three years. Um, the test was launched in the fall of 2015. Um, so we have a significant data set to now pull from um, in terms of you know, patient data and reactivity on our wheat zoomer test. But if you're not familiar with our wheat zoomer, um, let me just, you know, kind of give you the lowdown here. Um, and please feel free to call in and get more information about it. It is a fantastic test and a fantastic clinical tool. It is the most advanced test for celiac and wheat related disorders available on the market today. Uh, we are detecting IgG and IgA antibodies to 18 different wheat proteins at the peptide level. And that is a huge concept um, that we want you all to understand. Due to our microarray technology, we have been able to build the entire wheat proteome um, at the peptide level from the ground up. Most food sensitivity testing on the market um, is run at the protein level which um, introduces a lot of variability in terms of kind of uh, molecular mimicry, cross-reactivity of different amino acid sequences. At the peptide level, we really minimize any of that potential. We, we minimize the noise of, is this raw versus cooked? Um, and we just, uh, it allows for a higher accuracy of antibody antigen recognition. Um, the key proteins in the wheat proteome are laid out or arrayed on our chip, um, and we are able to offer, you know, ad highly specific and sensitive testing for these antibodies. Our wheat zoomer also includes our celiac panel in addition to our intestinal permeability panel, so we can really get this complete picture of how your body is really reacting to both gluten and non-gluten wheat proteins, how that is manifesting on the gut barrier in terms of intestinal permeability, and to rule in or rule out um, you know, a, a confirmed diagnosis of celiac. All right, um, looks like our slide got a little bit wonky here. Sorry for that squiggle in the middle. Um, but essentially, one of the studies we want to present to you today is a data set of looking at 713 subjects for which we had both a wheat zoomer test result and results from our ENA panel. And um, you know, before we go into this data, celiac, I'm sure, is all at the forefront of almost all of our minds. But we, you know, we were talking about connective tissue diseases as being, you know, a pretty common autoimmune disease in our country. Three percent um, commonality. Uh, celiac today is affecting about one percent of the population, and that's celiac itself. We are all aware that the that wheat disorders, wheat sensitivity exists on a spectrum. 
um, including wheat allergy, gluten sensitivity, and wheat sensitivity. So celiac is by all means not the be all end all. It's not celiac or no celiac. Um, but it is, of course, a, an important disease state to screen for. Um, and so we look at that in addition to all the other wheat markers on our wheat tumor. But going back to this data set, um, so 713 subjects from a two-year window, December 2015 to November 2017, that ran both our ENA, our vibrant ENA, and our wheat zoomer. Um, here's some really interesting bullets to share. So 5% had one or more positive celiac antibodies, and I think that that's pretty interesting um, in light of the fact that celiac currently is about 1% of the population. Now, um, these are looking, we look at four antibodies indicative of celiac, transglutaminase 2 and deaminated gliadin peptide. So just because you have one of the antibodies doesn't necessarily give you a confirmed celiac diagnosis, um, but usually indicates that you're having an, an autoimmune response to gluten, and we have to look at that in terms of your history and symptom manifestation. Um, but still, 5% is a, is a pretty good strong number of uh, patients presenting with positive celiac antibodies or a positive celiac panel, as we put it. 83%, on the other hand, had one or more positive marker on our wheat zoomer for wheat or gluten sensitivity. 12% were negative for all markers on wheat zoomer. So we get that question a lot. How often do we see a non-reactive wheat zoomer? It's not super common. But in this set, we are looking at about a 12% negative. Um, and so here's where it gets really cool. 29% of subjects that had those positive celiac antibodies also had positive ENA antibodies. So now we are seeing this, this pretty strong percentage of coincidence between celiac and ENA. Um, and not only that, 27% of subjects with non-celiac wheat sensitivity, so that means their celiac panel was negative, but they had, they fell into that 83% of one or more positive markers on the wheat zoomer, also had positive ENA antibodies. So the takeaway here is that we're finding that about one in five individuals with a gluten or wheat sensitivity also have these positive ENA markers. Um, and that is a very, very, very strong coinc uh, you know, coincidence of lab testing and speaks to the fact that, you know, really, if we are screening people for connective tissue disorders, we really should be screening them for celiac and gluten sensitivity as well. This is kind of a summary reiterating um, everything I said just now, but, um, about 30% of those individuals with celiac antibodies or wheat sensitivity um, have these positive ENAs compared to those individuals without positive celiac or wheat gluten sensitivity. And it's important to note here too that it's generally regarded that about 2% of the population is going to have these positive ENA markers. So we've taken that up 15 fold in the presence of a celiac or wheat or gluten sensitivity. So what do we do about it? I mean, I think I think we're probably all on this, this call today enlightened enough to know that with any sort of autoimmune condition, looking at intestinal permeability, looking at a person's reactivity, ruling out comorbid autoimmune diseases, celiac being paramount there is an important sort of first step. Um, but now we have the testing and we have the data to further support that. All right, so our second data set we want to present to you, and again, sorry, that slide got kind of Patty Wonkus here. Um, so a second set looking at our wheat zoomer results compared to patients who ran our rheumatoid arthritis panel. So here we've got a subset of 844 subjects um, that had both of these panels run um, on the same blood draw.
These, these patients were also reportedly symptomatic for joint pain, but um, 844 of them from that same two-year period, December 2015 to November 2017, um, so both had the RA panel and a wheat zoomer run. Of this data set, 6% had positive celiac antibodies. So that's similar to the 5% we saw in the, in the previous analysis. And of these 6% with a positive celiac panel, 20% had positive RA markers. And interestingly enough, it was a 50-50 split between the CCP3 and the, the rheumatoid factor um, antibody itself. 72% um, of this data set had a positive wheat had, had one or more positive antibodies for wheat or gluten on the wheat zoomer. Um, and of these 72, 18% had one or more positive RA antibodies as well. So again, here we're seeing that same approximate one in five individuals with gluten or wheat sensitivity um, having positive RA markers. And that's a pretty profound statistic. Um, again, speaking to the fact that for any of these patients with jo symptomatic joint pain kind of presenting on this autoimmune spectrum, we really want to screen them for not just celiac, but gluten and wheat sensitivity because it could be a, a paramount part of their healing and therapy. So for those of us who are sort of graphical, um, this is kind of repeating that. So of the 49 subjects that had celiac antibodies, 20% of those were also found to have positive RA markers. Um, and of the 605 subjects in that data set with positive wheat zoomer antibodies, 18% of those had positive RA markers. So it's a pretty strong correlation amongst the celiac um, subset, but it's also a pretty strong correlation against the, the gluten and wheat sensitive subjects as well. Um, I wanted to give a breakdown. So of that, you know, um, that 7.8% with the positive celiac panel, this is a breakdown of the individual celiac antibodies. Um, Again, like not every single celiac antibody defines or necessitates a celiac diagnosis. We'd have to kind of look a little deeper in terms of the history um, and, and patient symptomatology and probably keep an eye on this. But the, you know, tissue transglutaminase 2 IgA being sort of that slam dunk definitive marker for celiac disease, 1.6% of this population with the RA antibodies did have a positive TTG2 antibody. Um, and remember that 83% of these had at least one positive gluten or wheat antibody on the rest of the wheat zoomer. So the takeaway here, if we look at it from this angle, is that about four in five or 80% of the subset of people with positive RA antibodies were found to have gluten or wheat sensitivity, and, in, and about 8% of those were found to have positive celiac antibodies. So again, really, that's a, that's a very profound data set, in my opinion. Um, it's, it's just speaking to the coincidence of these conditions. And here we're representing that graphically, just if that's how your brain works, as mine does <laughs> most of the time. Okay, so undoubtedly, um, we love our wheat zoomer test. We think it is a highly valuable clinical tool. Um, we think it should really be run foundationally, uh, you know, on almost every patient that walks in your door, especially if you are practicing functional medicine and looking for root cause resolution. Um, we know that, you know, there are a lot of comorbid uh, statistics with celiac specifically, but the conversation of wheat and gluten goes way beyond celiac. With RA, um, we do know that there is some homology with the HLA associations, um, so there is some established crosstalk there. So always a good idea to run this wheat zoomer, you know, as a clinical tool if 
working with patients with any sort of autoimmune condition, especially with connective tissue disease. And so what we want to do next, I'm going to pass the presentation over and we want to present to you um, a couple pretty cool case studies that we have, we've, these have been patients that have flown across our desk or that we have worked with that highlight some of the utility of the wheat zoomer um, in ways you might not always think. Um, so I'm going to go ahead um, and pass the slides over to Tammy. We get a question all the time, you know, about running our wheat zoomer in a patient population who may have already taken the steps to remove gluten from their diet. Um, and you know, we always say that it's a good idea to run the test anyway, because it can highlight if a person is getting accidental exposure, um, uh, you know, or any sort of unintentional intake, our, um, our, our wheat zoomer can pick up on that. So um, actually, I think it's Suzanne who's going to present next. Um, so I'm going to let her take it away. Suzanne, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay. Bye. All right, perfect. Sorry about that. All right, let's see. Okay. So this is a case study of um, a 27-year-old female with a lot of neurological issues like gluten ataxia, peripheral neuropathies. Um, yeah, a lot of different uh, neurological issues. However, she had zero GI issues. So it really wasn't on anyone's radar to test her for celiac disease. Well, we ran a wheat zoomer on her in, this was actually a two-year case study. So February of 2016, you can see she is positive for celiac and she's pretty re reactive to everything uh, on the wheat zoomer. You can see the leaky gut panel she's got some pretty significant intestinal permeability uh, as well as the wheat germ gluten panel was positive um okay okay let's see sorry about that this is the non-gluten wheat panel so she was reactive to every one of those peptides as well as the tr transglutaminase panel three and six what I do not have a screenshot of is five months after this, she was to have, did a the ENA, she did the ENA and ANA panel, and she was positive for ANA, but not ENA. She was not of the ENA workers. After this celiac, this you know, wheat zoomer, she was placed on a completely gluten-free diet, and she was very diligent about the gluten-free diet. After nine months, she did not have resolution of symptoms, and we redid the wheat zoomer. And you can see right here that she did have resolution of transglutaminase 2. This was the previous test, and she was able to gain about three or four pounds. She initially was 5'9", 124 pounds, a BMI of about 18. So, um, all right. So then you can see on the leaky gut panel, it's actually, she, the, the leaky gut actually is worse than it was on the, on the first panel. And 
Um, the gliadins, a few of the gliadins are resolved and some of them are even worse. So what we discovered was um, that the celiac, that just doing the gluten-free diet was not helping at all. <laughs> not very much. A little bit of resolution transglutaminase too. So in January of 2017, she started um, an autoimmune diet. So very strict autoimmune diet. And in one month, there was some improvement in balance and coordination, the peripheral neuropathies, and then the ability to walk. At Christmas, she really wasn't able to walk. So in about a month's time, she was starting to be able to walk. She continued the autoimmune diet, and we did some retesting about three months later, and you start to see some resolution um, here, not only of the symptoms, but the gliadin peptide, the reactivity is reduced in the gliadins, and then um, this was a retest about, oh, this was October, so about nine months into the autoimmune diet, and you can see further, this is the non-gluten wheat panel, you could see some further resolution here. Upon continuation, um, things just really uh, kept improving as far as the symptoms and um, the weight gain. And you can see 15 months, this is all the way forward to April of this year. With the retest, you can see complete resolution in the gliadin peptides, which was really awesome to see. You can see the previous ones, that was the last test from October on the right and then the one on the left from April 15. This is the non-gluten wheat panel. So not complete resolution, but what we're seeing is, re, you know, removal of all the grains. I've, I've seen this pattern over and over with the celiacs that I'm working with. They really, in order to, in that healing phase, really uh, it's important to remove all the grains. I don't know whether it's just there's gluten even in the non even in the non gluten containing grains they're either there's either cross contamination there's some kind of um, accidental exposure going on I know that there have been some studies with um, with different grains like even um, the quinoas. Uh, and some of the other non gluten containing grains that may be contaminated even even in the field where they 're produced with stray wheat and things like that, so in the healing phase, I think it's i 'm seeing over and over that the removal of all the grains is provides the the, mo the quickest and most effective healing route um, Here are just this is kind of an overview. The to we, we, do, we look at total IgG and IgA on our wheat zoomer to see if the immune system is, is working well and to see if there's enough of the immunoglobulins to actually provide good results for the testing. And you can see that she was actually started out low, IgG, and over the course of time, the last value is here, the 802, and, and so she, her total IgG and IgA um, have increased. So um, the next one is a comparison of the transglutaminase 3 which and transglutaminase 6, and these are enzymes, if you're familiar with the wheat zoomer, transglutaminase 3 is looking generally at issues um, in the epidermal layer, skin issues, and transglutaminase 6 is looking at neurological issues. So you can see for her transglutaminase 6, which is often associated with that gluten ataxia, she started out in in 2016, she was still, she was 1.3, and by April of 2018, she's 0.68, and she's no longer um, having issues with gluten ataxia. This is the wheat germaglutinin, that is a lectin of wheat we know that can interfere with vitamin D absorption. So she started out positive IgG and IgA to wheat germaglutinin, and then in April, the last testing, 2018, she uh, is back in the control range for the wheat germaglutinin. 
So the current status of this particular patient, she is now 29 years old. So she would report that she's had about 93% reduction in symptoms. We know um, because when the body attacks biotin, it can often attack myelin. Um, so the attack is stopped, but we know that ner nerves do normally heal overnight, but she's had a lot of healing. So the ataxia is resolved. Her balance and coordination issues are resolved. Per most of the peripheral neuropathy, there's just a little residual there, and she's been able to maintain a weight of about 136 pounds. So, um, yeah, I think that's it for that case study. All right, I'm gonna pass the screen now to Tammy. Hi everyone, my name is Tammy Russell and thanks for attending our webinar today. It's been great getting to know some of you and having some wonderful discussions on the phone about um, different tests that we offer. And a lot of the focus, as you have seen so far on this webinar, is on the Wheat Zoomer test. And I think it is the coolest test ever. Um, myself, having been a practitioner and being aligned with many different lab companies, um, seeing the, the sheer amazing sensitivity and specificity of this test has been um, incredible. And one of the take home messages that I just want to tell you now and a little bit later is, is really the importance of testing not just once but a few times with the wheat zoomer test because it is so high um, it allows people to catch where they might be falling um, in terms of their adherence to a gluten-free diet so um, it really allows somebody to gauge how they're doing with their progress on a gluten-free diet because i think there's a lot of confusion um, and we try to clear that up on the phone but you know this is a good um, kind of stage to do that as well. Um, and we can't reiterate enough the importance of just seeing the results on paper and seeing, you know, hey, but I thought I was gluten free for the last three years, but I'm still showing an immune response. So um, it's so important to get that baseline test done and then keep testing. So um, we're looking at some data here to show um, the, the popularity of a gluten-free diet and then subsequently people's adherence to it. So here we see in an NHANES survey the trends of prevalence of celiac disease and people without celiac on a gluten-free diet. Really interesting here is on the right column we have, um, we have the numbers, it's like 0.7 and this is the, the prevalence and then we go down um, from 2009, 2010 to 2013, 2014, and people with celiac really haven't changed. Um, the range is, is still pretty much with a certain confine. However, when you look at the, the numbers of people on a gluten-free diet, it jumps from 0.52 within that time range to 1.69, which represents three times more people on a gluten-free diet without celiac. So, you know, we have to question what's what's going on. <laughs> what is it about gluten? Um, you know, certainly it's it's just a, it's 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 unsettling. But we're here to to help people on this journey. So, um, in a recent study in the Nutrition Journal, looking at um, the gluten-free diet and assessing the adherence to it, some of the quotes from that article are, are pretty fascinating. And they say self-reported gluten-free diet adherence does not account for the possibility of unintentional gluten ingestion and overestimates free gluten gluten-free diet adherence also individuals who believe they are following a gluten-free diet are not readily able to identify foods that are gluten-free which suggests ongoing gluten consumption even amongst those who are quote-unquote strictly adherent so you know this just underscores the potential um, confusion over what constitutes a true gluten-free diet and, you know, as the, on the team of, of um, you know, here at Vibrant, the clinical team, what we really try to do is explain what went wrong. You know, how might somebody have been exposed on their journey to have a pure 100% gluten-free diet? So we're gonna look at some lab tests that are pretty fascinating in a few different patients. This one is a 75-year-old that had a biopsy proven celiac since 1981. He um, or she said that they were on a strict gluten-free diet. However, when you look at the results here, you'll see many of the markers in red 
and in yellow indicating an immune response from an exposure to either the wheat plant or gluten itself. Um, when we look at the gliadin panel, gliadin is usually the troublemaker or um, the instigator with um, gluten problems. Gliadin is one part of the gluten protein and glutenin is the other. So in the wheat zoomer, we try to be as comprehensive as possible. We look at every single part of the wheat plant that, that can cause an immune response or sensitivity in an individual. So this test is showing that they, this person is reacting to the wheat germ of glutenin, the isomers of gliadin, the um, high molecular weight glutenin and the low molecular weight glutenin, um, as well as some of the non-gluten wheat proteins. So that's pretty interesting. Also here we have a three-year-old whose parents said was very strict gluten-free, very clean, mostly whole foods diet for a year. You might notice that the total IgA is depressed. That's because um, in a three-year-old, or actually in a, in a child that's between the ages of two to four, their IgA range is from 27 to 246. So here, even though the parents said that their daughter or son was on a very strict gluten-free diet, um, we still see an immune response with the isomers of gliadin, glutenin, and the non-gluten wheat proteins indicating an exposure. Here's another example of a 57-year-old patient on an autoimmune paleo diet for what they said was years. And it looks mostly green. Um, it's rare that we see an all green or a test this green. Um, however, they are still having an immune response at the level of the, amyl the amylase and protease inhibitor. That is part of the wheat plant. So um, we would then infer that this patient could have been exposed to some part of the wheat plant in the last three months prior to this test. And, and just to really underscore, you know, the, the advantage with vibrant testing is that it is so comprehensive. I mean, we have antibody detection of four different gliadoisoforms, deaminated gliadin, wheat, gluten, and glutenin, serpents, ferritins, globulins, amylase protease inhibitors, zonulin, actin, LPS, gluteomorphins, prodinorphins, total IgA and IgG, transglutaminases 2 and 3 and 6, um, TDG, DGP complex, which is a novel fusion peptide created by Vibrant. So we really left no stone unturned. Um, and in looking at what's offered by other tests, they might look at transglutaminase antibodies alone or possibly in conjunction with endomycel antibodies. Um, however, for most patients, this is not um, detecting a persistent villus atrophy despite their efforts at a gluten-free diet. So if you have the most comprehensive a test available on the market, why not do it? Um, and again, you know, we always, we always hear um, try to stress test, don't guess, and retest, don't guess. Retest to see how you're doing on your gluten-free diet. And truthfully, um, what is the daily mean intake of gluten in our country? Um, there is an unknown safe threshold of non-celiac gluten sensitivity and wheat sensitivity. However, based on current research, safe is likely to vary for, for each individual. So this article described that in the American diet, the range of gluten intake is about 5 to 15 grams um, per day. Adults on a gluten-free diet um, get about 244 milligrams. So this is significantly less. However, it's still representative of an exposure. And in children age four free diet, they estimated they were about 387 milligrams. And children's age zero to three on a gluten-free diet, about 155 milligrams. So um, there, this indicates that people are still getting exposed to gluten despite their efforts at a gluten-free diet. And also what's interesting is that gluten-free foods in the US do allow 20 parts per million of gluten, whereas other countries only allow three parts per million. And ultimately in the US, gluten-free eaters consume about seven times more gluten in gluten-free foods. Now, how do we extrapolate that to um, an immune response and sensitivity and villus atrophy and the whole autoimmune cascade, um, I think is, has yet to be fully um, delineated, but you know, certainly it, it, it would be something to, to look into and study. Um, we should keep it in mind though, 
um, and that's the whole point of this part of the presentation is, you know, how well are we doing on a gluten-free diet? Um, this article published recently in the Nutrition Journal, um, the researchers looked at the self-reported gluten-free diet adherence and found that only 55% of those considered themselves on a strict gluten-free diet. 21% um, of those respondents said they had the rare but unintentional gluten exposure. 9% said they had a rare but intentional um, gluten exposure. 9% of those tried to avoid gluten most of the time, which as you may know, it's better to be all or nothing. Um, and 7% of those were unsure, but trying to have a gluten-free diet. And then in another study, um, they looked at 82 respondents, um, those that said they were about six years on a gluten-free diet. And this study really tried to look at um, what people considered um, to be gluten-free in their diet? Like, what was their knowledge of gluten-free foods? And they found that no participant correctly identified the gluten content of 17 foods. <laughs> That's pretty wild. And only 30% identified 14 foods correctly, um, meaning that 70% of those that were surveyed perhaps didn't have a good grasp on um, the definition or nature of what constituted a gluten-free food. So now I'm going to turn the presentation um, back to our clinical team. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tammy. That was, that was um, wow. I didn't actually, I mean, I've been doing this for a while and I don't think I was aware of just how many people don't actually either know what foods are gluten-free or don't really truly follow a gluten-free diet, which I guess at Vibrant, we see that a lot because we do look at lots of people's labs all day long, and I'm sure everyone on the clinical team can attest to, you know, plenty of, op, you know, I guess, um, occurrences of reviewing labs with somebody who swears they're gluten-free, and then it turns out they're really not, and, you know, I think there's probably a lot of misunderstanding of what's gluten-free, but then also, um, you know, lots of cases of accidental or even intentional cross-contamination or exposure to gluten. And as providers, I guess we just have to be really aware of that. So, all right, I'm gonna jump in really quick and walk you guys through these super cool resources that we just put together. Um, you may have already seen them if your field sales rep has stopped by your office with one of these. So if you have seen these before, that's awesome. That's what we love to hear. Um, we basically have two resources. One of them sort of encapsulates the majority of Vibrance functional testing that's available. Um, and so I'll kind of briefly just sort of show you what that is and, and what it means. Um, these are sort of a decision tree. So if you have a new patient in front of you that's got lots of stuff going on and you kind of don't really know where to start, but you know that there's some gastrointestinal stuff, right? Um, this is sort of your guide for which of Vibrant's tests would you run? Um, because we have a lot, right? And, and sometimes they are kind of confusing as far as which one does what and what should I run next or what should I run with it? Um, so we sort of have put this together as a guide to help you make those decisions if you're not real familiar with which test. Um, by all means, the Wheat Zoomer is an amazing first-line test. I know we talk about that one quite a lot. Um, it's, it's relevant in so many situations. However, there might be some times where you would run another test first. Um, and so, you know, this is sort of your guide to how to do that. And then when you get that test back, what's on it? And what do you do with that information? Um, and so this is sort of that... I guess, basic entry level kind of starting point to Vibrance functional testing. It's also going to give you some guidance as far as additional things you might want to look at. So for instance, we have, um, let me see if I can draw here. So with our gut pathogens, which um, is similar to our gut zoomer, um, essentially the gut pathogens, the main focus of that test is obviously the pathogens. 
Um, let's say that you do have a positive pathogen, obviously you're going to treat based on CDC guidelines, you know, based on which antibiotics that pathogen responds to, um, or if you choose to use antimicrobial herbals or botanicals. Um, but then something else you might want to follow up with is looking at inflammatory markers for things like cardiovascular, um, cardiovascular inflammation, as well as cholesterol and lipids. Um, the reason for that is there's a strong connection between bacterial pathogens in the gut and systemic arterial inflammation and, and cardiovascular disease risk. So just little pointers like that to give you sort of an idea of where to go next. And so, you know, sometimes, sometimes, you know, you get a patient that comes in and really wants to run a food sensitivity test because they're convinced they have food sensitivities. Um, what we find just in clinical practice here at Vibrant is that most people who think they have food sensitivities probably don't. They probably have intestinal permeability. Um, they probably also have SIBO or a FODMAP intolerance, which is usually an indication of SIBO um, in most cases. Or they may have uh, some developing Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, which means a you know a specific carbohydrate diet or GAPS diet might be more appropriate. So. There are certain foods they feel that they get more symptomatic when they consume them, and so they assume those are food sensitivities. But um, another test might be a more appropriate test to start with, like a wheat zoomer, or if you do suspect SIBO, an IBS sure test um, along with a gut zoomer would probably be a more appropriate starting point. So just kind of keep in mind that um, symptom overlap occurs and this is sort of meant to give you a guide for which tests you might want to consider. So I'm going to go into the other one that we have. So this one goes specifically into intestinal permeability. Um, so let's say you've run that wheat zoomer and you have that intestinal permeability panel. This we get lots of questions of well, what's the difference between anti-zonulin and anti-actin? Or how would I treat somebody differently if they have anti-LPS versus if they don't? So this is meant to walk you through some of those decisions and give you a little bit of, again, kind of surface level introduction to interpreting those tests and sort of what would be next steps. Because most of the time, the wheat zoomer is not the only test you're going to run on a patient. If it happens to be the first test you run on that patient, you're going to then, based on what that wheat zoomer shows, probably run some additional follow-up testing of some sort. And this is sort of which of those tests you might think about running. Um, so obviously today you heard quite a lot about our connective tissue and RA. Um, we have some pending publications and white papers coming about looking at thyroid antibodies specifically, which are going to be really exciting. Um, so if you're not running any of these panels, consider incorporating that into your practice because there is such a high rate of co-occurrence between wheat-related disorders and autoimmunity, um, whether it's connective tissue, RA, or thyroid. Um, so we have actin, anti-LPS, zonulin, with or without positive anti-actin. Um, so these kind of give you those flows, those steps, um, when it would be appropriate to run um, IBS Shore, when it would be appropriate to run a neural zoomer. We also have micronutrient here. And then if you haven't um, seen or run yet Vibrant's new corn or lectin zoomers, those are also excellent tests to follow up with okay, I see intestinal permeability, my patient did not respond to a gluten-free diet, or they're still symptomatic three months later, possibly look at corn or lectin, or run one of those with your wheat zoomer, um, because some people, right off the bat, that helps you personalize their gut healing protocol. Instead of putting them on eat no lectins or no grains, you could run those tests alongside a wheat zoomer and tell them specifically which lectins or grains to avoid because they're gonna be specific to certain foods, obviously. Um, so we just wanted to kind of show you that these are available. If you haven't already received a copy, um, contact your regional sales director um, or your regional sales um, rep for your territory to get a copy of that. But we can also email um, uh, myself I think your registration emails come through my email address, so you can email me, or 
anybody on the clinical team can also send these to you. Um, some of you may have even gotten them after calling in and doing a clinical consult. So if you haven't already and you'd like a copy of them, let us know. They should be also available on the educational portal 